But goodness, just because this is my last official access to a microphone here, um, I don't want it to get all nostalgic, but uh, might be a little bit of that. Might be a little bittersweet. Uh, I've taken to introducing myself since gets the job done quickly. I don't even have to do that. I am Alicia Longwell. I'm the chief cure at the Lewis B. and Dorothy <clears throat> Coleman chief curator here at the museum, uh, wrapping up my uh, 39th year. I won't make it to 39. <laughs> yes, I heard a wow. Uh, it is a wow. I wasn't. Uh, I didn't have this elevated title when I came. I came as the registrar, which meant that I had had a wonderful background in really objects and looking at art and measuring art and uh, determining the medium of art, which all those skills learned at MoMA and uh, right out of college stood me and have stood st stood me in good stead all these years because. You really have to know about the volume plasticity. You have to know everything about a work of art, which uh, sad to say we don't always uh, see in slides and or this wonderful thing called Google where you can look up almost any painting in the whole wide world at your leisure. Look, I'm a big, big fan. Even Wikipedia, yes. but. <laughs> um, you know, it, it is the question of, uh, let's face it, museums are in the people and art coming together business, so we'll always uh, go back to that. You do need to see the real objects, and I will say today, maybe just for fun, we should all go back and look at uh, some of the Vicentes that I'm going to talk to talk about and uh, that you really need to look at up closely, maybe a little bit more closely than you might have originally thought. Now that's sort of a tease to get you back in the gallery. I'm sure most of you have seen the shows or hope so or hope you will before um, you leave today. So today I'm going to talk, I spoke about Soroya last week sort of in um, depth. I hope um, um, apparently it wasn't too clear that this would be Exclu not exclusive, mostly about Vicente today, but anyway, we can toggle back and forth. The uh, interesting thing about both exhibitions, which uh, both artists in the exhibition, The Light in the Garden, is that there are similarities, particularly, or most especially late in life, where their art, their families, and their gardens was the, were their great passions. And that's the premise of the show, and it rings very true as I hope you've seen in the, um, in the, three, in the two galleries that the exhibition is in. Um, there's a strong focus on Vicente. How could we not? He's someone who lived here over, and spent time here, painted here, worked here over 50 years of his life, and was very well known to many of you. Who, did anyone know him personally here? Ooh, look at all the hands. Uh, I can't see who's out there, but... <laughs> Um, he was, uh, Joel, <laughs> for one, yeah, uh, he was an extraordinary man, um, just as a, a, a force of nature. He was an impressive bearing. Um, I remember he, uh, you could see him walking along Montauk Highway, and this was not something you saw many people do, uh, the house that he and his wife Harriet uh, purchased in 1964 when they um, moved out here. I mean, to spend more time here. They had spent time before that, but they wanted a house of their own. And um, I think it was um, uh, Esteban who said you know, they were shown some fancy houses or fancier south of the highway, and he said, I'll, I'm not living there. That's not where I want to live. But they settled on a beautiful old farmhouse, um, uh, sort of the Dutch Revival, it's called, because of that roof line. And um, as I said, stayed there many years. And he walked. This, it's on, it's on uh, Montauk Highway Bridge, Hampton, just, just after the high school, if you're heading east. And he would walk. Every day they were here, about a half mile up to the post office to get the post. 
And then he'd stop at the candy kitchen, which I'm sure is known to many of you, and um, you could call it a cafe or an ice cream parlor, or a combination of the two. He always said he liked the strong coffee and the good gossip there. And he could always, the local gossip, and he could always pick up a, a New York Times <laughs> and go back. And that was the first thing he did in the studio every morning. As I say, even my children would say, look, Mama, when they were little, they would go, look, Mama, there's that man walking down the street, you know. <laughs> my colleague, Chris, has a story about uh, uh, her mother running into, I think she didn't actually know he was an artist, but just a very impressive yeah. person walking on the highway, beautiful with a, a Panama hat in the summer, right? And she, hello. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it was an unusual sight. Um, at any way, at any rate, um, we can go back here to 1903. Uh, there's a very cherubic young uh, Stabon on his mother's lap. Um, with two older siblings. He actually, they would be three, three other younger siblings. Um, that's his mother, Sophia, his father, who was in the Civil Guard, as you can uh, tell by his uniform. He himself was an amateur painter, amateur artist, and he, the younger sons, or I think maybe that older son, and both another son also became, besides the stable, became uh, painters themselves. They were born in a little town or village really called Tregano, uh, which is um, in Castilla y Leon, but uh, near Segovia, a bit of a distance from Madrid. But he would frequently, uh, even on the weekends, take the boys down to um, uh, down to Madrid, and they would go, of course, to the Prado. Uh, one of the most extraordinary museums in the world, which um, even in 1903 had an a extraordinary collection, uh, thanks to uh, some of the people who'd been uh, on the throne uh, in Spain, who were able to collect not only Spanish artists, but great, great Dutch and French, everybody, you know. If any of you have been to the Prado, you know it's an encyclopedic uh, collection. So. He, uh, legend has it that Esteban made his first trip to the Prado at the tender age of four. So I think just by the scale of the person there on the right, looking at the, uh, that's of course Velasquez, uh, Las Meninas, the bridesmaids or the little maids in attendant to the little girl in the middle who is the Infanta, uh, the daughter of the king and queen. Um, so you can see a four-year-old wouldn't even make it into the picture frame <laughs> for, for the, in this shot. And that's just uh, how amazingly uh, impressive it would have been for a, a little uh, person to see this kind of artwork, but uh, the scale alone. But this is what he did see. And um, the family actually moved to Madrid uh, shortly after that um, the, uh, his father sort of transferred within the Civil Guard and uh, he grew up in Madrid. The, um, the Velazquez painting is of course 1452, it's a 15th century painting that was sort of, and, and Velazquez, um, we spoke uh, last week about him being such an enormous influence on uh, Soroya as well, as any number of artists you could name, William Merritt Chase or John Singer Sargent. I mean, this, this painting, in the way, um, was the touchstone for uh, artists. I have to assume artists are still looking at this work. Um, next. Esteban was in, um, went to a military school for a, a while. Um, he quickly uh, sort of transferred into a uh, secondary school that focused on art, and by 16, uh, he was already enrolled at the um, uh, uh, School of Beaux-Arts, the Museo uh, de Bellas Artes in 
Madrid. He started out as a sculptor. And you see him here uh, in, a, in a studio as a student there at the school with another, I would assume, uh, willing student who's posing for him. He stuck with that about three years and then decided that painting, uh, sculpture was not for him. Um, I think it's good to come to a decision like that early on in a career. Um, something about it um, did not appeal, although um, he later in life said it was great training. Um, his, when he, by the time he was in New York, he was great, great friends with an artist named Willem de Kooning, uh, who also was a, an emigre, you would say, to um, the U.S. And um, de Kooning always said that he and Vicente shared that classical training, which he thought many of his American uh, confrères did not, uh, that he knew that both he and of course, he, de Kooning, raised in Rotterdam, but um, went to school there, but really exposed to these old master paintings that was something that yeah, he felt his colleagues might not have been. Um, on the right, there's a class uh, of, the, of the sculpture group. Interesting, there's a, a young female student there as well. I think that's Vicente in the foreground. Um, once he just sort of switched from sculpture to painting, um, he went on. We don't know a whole lot about his work um, in the 1920s. Um, this on the left is a painting from about that time. That's, in fact, his sister, uh, Rosario. Um, and on the right is actually a later drawing, very beautiful drawing, pen and ink, from 1934, and this is uh, really the only couple of things I've, I've uh, seen reproduced from that period. Uh, we learned that he later was, had been very unhappy with the way his career was going. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but um, it, it's not surprising that these are the few things that we've seen. Um, he did go to, and, and Madrid in the 20s was a very, um, uh, evolving as a very uh, center of mo modernism. The great poet uh, Federico Lorca, um, Garcia Lorca was there. The filmmaker uh, Luis Bunuel uh, was young and in Madrid at that time. Uh, I quoted Bunuel last week when he said, um, uh, Spain at the turn of the century was still medieval. Uh, it was very much, very much controlled by the church. Uh, very much the uh, customs and mores were very much of an, another time. But uh, these young artists were doing their best to uh, revolutionize that. By 1929, um, Vicente was in Paris. Uh, he visited a artist on the Rue de la Boite. <laughs> there he is, Mr. Picasso. Can you sort of, it's a little dark, can you make out what's in the background there? Anyone? A painting he just picked up <laughs> somewhere. Uh, it's the great uh, Henri Rousseau, uh, sometimes called the Douanier Rousseau because he was a tax collector. He was a Sunday painter. And uh, it was really Picasso who discovered him uh, discovered who he was and where he was and what he'd been doing all his whole life and really brought this to the attention. He's, um, I'm sure some of you have seen the great paintings in MoMA, uh, like the Gypsy, and um, a real discovery that a young painter, looking forward as he was, like Picasso, would also be looking back, as it were, to... Um, probably one of the 20th century's uh, earliest and most interesting painters out of the mainstream. Well, um, Picasso um, was there, as many, many other, of course, young painters were. Um, by 19, um, it was also in the 1920s that he went, he, Vicente went back and forth to America a couple of times. Um, he, again, another, well, what he had in, uh, 
common with de Kooning, and they would be the sort of the most prominent of artists who had really been raised in other countries and came here and brought their own sort of unique way of looking at American life. Um, there's a very funny story about de Kooning who came over on a ship, basically worked, either stowed away or some worked on the ship. Um, it just it, uh, went into Newark as the port, and he apparently jumped ship, and he jumped ship, and he was basically uh, wandering around on the Newark waterfront. He went into, as he tells the story, he went into a cafe there. Commuters were hurriedly um, going back and forth, and um, the counterman had set up she may see coffee, coffee cups, coffee cups, coffee cups, coffee cups, and was just pouring like this, you know. <laughs> he was just doing the fastest thing he could to get the cups in the coffee and in the hand of the workers and the commuters. And apparently de Kooning said, boy, that's what America is. <laughs> and uh, Vicente, too, had that, <clears throat> you know, that... Uh, great zest for America and also maybe step back and uh, uh, really remember that both there, uh, that they had both come from a much more, uh, much different culture, so to speak. But boy, that was America as far as de Kooning was concerned. Um, uh, here's, so uh, by the end, he actually, um, in the 30s in New York, he actually was working on behalf of the Spanish res resistance with that, um, uh, with that government. By 39, the Spanish Civil War, of course, had ended. He was back in New York again in, the 19, in 1940 and um, had a studio on uh, 10th Street between 4th Avenue and, thir and 3rd, which was really sort of the hotbed of artist studios and also um, the downtown art scene that we think of with the Cedar Tavern and all that. That, that was really when the axis went from 57th Street uptown to um, 10th Street downtown, really around there. Uh, galleries like the Tanager Gallery, um, open there, and this is where the young artists were both um, living and working and showing. So it was a pretty tight-knit community. Um, de Kooning, uh, eventually, later, de Kooning's studio was on 4th Avenue, there at 10th Street. Uh, Vicente went into a building on um, 10th Avenue, uh, 10th Street, just East 10th Street, just around the corner. And they eventually had uh, studios right next to one another. A uh, very important um, visitor to his studio that um, de Kooning had, and let's just assume Vicente would have had as well, was Arshel Gorky, um, our, our, who was born in Armenia, came to this country. Um, we have a beautiful work by Gorky, which is on view right now in our sort of other artists, other gardens, uh, pendant exhibition to the Soroya Vicente. And um, that, that Gorky is from 1943 and is extraordinarily important because it's the year that Gorky really sort of abandoned his uh, what he was doing with abstraction and really surrealism. He was sort of dabbling, and this would be throughout the 30s, dabbling with that, so to speak. And he had grown up really often going to his father's farm around Lake Vaughan in Armenia. He was very much attached to having grown up there and, and that whole aspect of his family, which was so wrenched from him when he uh, and a sister were able to come to New York, their mother perished really in the uh, genocide in that uh, country experience then. So he sort of had packed away all that um, involvement with nature, had gone in sort of another direction. But by the time he was here in the 40s and had married a wonderful young American girl whose family had a farm in Virginia, and she sensed that it might be good to 
go back to the countryside. Maybe they'd had a new baby. So they went down to this rural Virginia to um, spend the summer. And apparently uh, Gorky was just totally overwhelmed by being this able to walk out, actually sit uh, on the ground. <laughs> he just sort of sat for many weeks and sort of reabsorbed all these uh, memories. And then he um, began to draw. He drew his one said over 200 drawings that summer. And these came right into the, and the drawing on view is one of those. So it has an extraordinary, because this is the, this, this is where the whole story of 20th century art pivots in a way, because he went right into looking at nature, taking his abstraction from nature, and uh, these studies went into the great painting series right after that, things like the livers and the coxcomb and, and paintings that we identify with Gorky at that period. So he had this breakthrough and don't think he didn't come back and don't think every young artist, de Kooning especially, was very close to, but Pollock, you would have to say, Vicente would have also seen this sort of breakthrough work, and it really pointed the way for those younger artists who, who are sort of, you might say, on the cusp of abstract expressionism to go that extra uh, distance to really break through. Um, so um, I'm um, given the proximity of de Kooning and Gorky and um, and Vicente at this time. You have to. You have to feel that there was all that sort of cross discussions, pollination. Um, this is an interesting um, photograph, uh, three photographs of um, de Kooning. And of course his um, then wife, uh, Elaine de Kooning, uh, extraordinary painter in her own right, also a very, very good art critic uh, working for Art News as well, which will come into play with Vicente in a moment. But this is the summer they spent in, oh goodness, where were they? East Hampton. <laughs> I knew, Georgica, to be more specific. Uh, his dealer was Leo Castelli at that point. Uh, Castelli had um, bought a home in Georgica, he and his wife, uh, Eliana would become Eliana Sonnebed. But um, they often invited artists out. The next summer they had Paul Brock and Mimi Shapiro. But this summer, 47, they invited um, de Kooning and Elaine. She kept the name de Kooning. Uh, as soon as she married, she changed her name. Everyone, all she was Elaine Freed. Everyone was always very suspicious of that because she held on to that name for forever. They never really divorced. And uh, she actually, at the end of his life, she came back and was um, really cared for him in his last days. Anyway, I got ahead of myself, but I do that. But let's go back to this summer <laughs> in Georgica. So uh, what, what Castelli had done, this is, this is actually a porch. You can see those open doors there. They built a wall something for uh, de Kooning to sort of paint on. And that's what he did. He worked all that summer. And although he didn't produce a lot, it leads right into a very famous painting that came directly after that, sort of his last large, um, what you would call an easel painting. But these are uh, Hans Namas photographs, as you can see. Uh, he was an extraordinary photographer, if you know the Jackson Pollock sort of dancing down the canvas on the floor of the barn. Those are, of course, by Namath too, and even the film um, of Pollock painting where Namath had the idea he'd put a giant piece of plate glass sort of on, I don't know, cement block supports or anywhere, on the ground outside in springs, and he could crawl under there with his camera and that's the famous film that you see with Pollock. <laughs> Pollock right on top and painting on, dripping painting on the glass. So Hans Namath, we owe 
a huge debt to. He photographed almost all the artists here uh, working on the East End. So that's 47, that's where de Kooning was. And in this painting, Excavation, which you can see it's coming out of this, uh, this is very different from what uh, all the artists had been doing. And the man on the right is Harold Rosenberg, another famous critic who just uh, took to dropping in on, um, on, Pollock, uh, on de Kooning's studio. So the thing of this, this is an amazing hub on 10th Street. Even by later years with Soho, it gets all spread out, but at the moment, um, uh, you know, you were living next door to one of the brownstones. Or your, your studio would be in the basement or up higher, probably, but next door would be, second floor would be a gallery. So this is where people congregated. This is where people saw one another. And um, that's... Artists like to talk to other artists. I would say that. Do we have artists here? like to share, uh, looking at one another's work. This is the, the, this, this is the, like to talk to one another about progress on a work. Um, as anyone, I think, in a creative uh, mode does like feedback in that sense. Uh, and he got a, <laughs> de Kooning got a lot from Harold Rosenberg. Rosenberg, of course, famously coined the term action painting, which um, has been taken up with a great banner um, particularly when you think of like Pollock, that was uh, the action painting there. Oh, wrong way, Corrigan. Hmm. Um, here's a random uh, museum opening or a gallery opening on the right, or sort of in the center there is uh, Elaine de Kooning and she's talking to uh, Esteban. Um, interestingly, um, you know, today as in that time, uh, one got out, met people, ran into people at openings, uh, got a discussion going. In fact, uh, they talked shortly after this about uh, Elaine doing a piece on Vicente for, uh, she worked at Art, Art News. Tom Hess was the great crusading uh, editor there, and um, Elaine was um, also a important editor there. You may have um, heard of the, also a lot of poets wrote about art at that point. And Fairfield Porter also wrote uh, art criticism as well as painting. So there was a great mix in these um, sort of um, people, uh, you didn't have to be an art critic to write about art and be published in art news. And that's what gave that publication this incredible flavor. Well, there was an ongoing series in the magazine called So-and-So Paints a Painting. And um, Elaine was very intrigued. I'm just using first names here because otherwise it gets confusing with de Kooning. Um, Elaine was very taken with what she'd seen of, of Esteban's work. By 1949, he was sort of taking up a, uh, a way of making art that maybe hadn't been used as much since uh, Mr. Picasso and Mr. Brock were using that uh, way, of course, collage. Um, apparently, he was invited to, he, Vicente, was invited to teach at the University of UC Berkeley. He went out for a summer there to teach, and when he got there, he was sort of promised room to work and uh, he found he had absolutely no studio space. He was a little flummoxed as to what he could do. He had brought some basic supplies, but he you know, just didn't have room to bring canvas in. So he thought he would sort of return to this idea of collage, which almost every uh, painter has uh, practiced at one point or another, but it became um, a real path uh, for Vicente. Interestingly, he said something interesting I thought I would quote. He said, and this is when he was first beginning, he would go on for five decades to use collage interchangeably and also would do as many, probably five paintings a year and then five collages as well. He said, 
Collage is a technique to arrive at a painting. Collage is a sketch for a painting. Collage is a substitute for painting. And that's the interesting thing. He thought of these uh, different mediums, certainly, as really interchangeable and called it, um, he called it paintings with paper. It never was a lesser mode of expression in his mind. Um, and here we see him uh, during the interview um, that uh, Elaine was conducting for the article. This is the first page of the article in Art News. So he had um, this table with his supplies and an old wine bottle and <laughs> maybe some other uh, potables. Um, there, and almost as you would see paint brushes and pots of paint uh, for an artist, this was in fact the, the area with collage and a drawer full of, he would often um, use, um, he would most often tear or rip, whatever you want to say, but he loved the ja he, hand, as you can see him sort of tearing, had that um, uh, sort of uneven edge. He liked that very much. He did cut sometimes and paste um, by cutting, but what he most liked to do was kind of, and you'll see other uh, images of him really sort of in this very aggressive gesture. Um, in that, that summer at Berkeley, he had actually found a stack of newspapers and was intrigued by the color ads and that's when he first uh, actually thought, because there was some great color. Uh, it said, he said it reminded him of the woodblock comic books or comic illustrated uh, works that he'd seen as a child. So he would actually do this with newspaper, with print, with any kind of, he would do it with finer papers, but um, all to the, here's some more instances of his. Of course, you might think of working on a tabletop Certainly, he preferred to uh, use like a, a board, a bulletin board sort of thing, a cork board, and work this way. Now, you hear endless discussions about the picture plane. Is it vertical? Is it this way? Well, you know, well, this is really basically upended um, that idea. It's very clearly like a painting and on the wall. And these would, as he said, sometimes lead into painting, sometimes uh, not. Um, what I think this is, uh, I'm going to show just some earlier work because all the work by Vicente on view here is from much later in his life. So that the comparison between the two layers, uh, artists, is um, uh, parallel in that way. So I'm just, these happen to be in our collection, so I'm happy to show. This is a very early uh, collage from 49. In fact, that same year that he first began to do it, you can almost see the sort of looking more like, you know, almost uh, what de Kooning was doing in that sense, but uh, very different, the gesture, the way of making it, of course, was quite different. Um, some other really beautiful ones in our collection that I'll just, again, earlier. This is from 1953. This is actually one that um, Vicente and his wife Harriet gave us, which is a lovely, lovely thing, um, back in the <clears throat> early 1990s. He, um, you can't see it here, but the red, I got my trusty, oop, here it is. Um. Um, I would say they're drawing, and we'll talk about the ones on view, and you know, they're like this. Yeah, yeah, some, um, yeah, but this here, you can't see, but just there, just sort of, just ripped is, um, you can see the Museum of Modern Art. So it was obviously a catalog cover, but you know, what a beautiful color it is. And uh, so some, again, some papers are, are painted, so they will have some uh, different texture than, you can see this edge along here where he's talking about ripping. Um, I don't see any that really look they, like they might have been cut. Oh, of course, he did use that for a more precise uh, form. This one is, 
and he did not um, do a lot of this. You would call these with the sort of Rauschenberg elements, you know, of, of um, labels or, or um, a lot of words in them. He didn't do very many of these. He, he began to think they were a little too, maybe, I mean, Rauschenberg wasn't quite, he was coming up then, but, uh, but this idea much more like Schwitters, who was a, a, a Swiss artist who was very, very famous for this um, sort of Meritzbau, as he called them, the sort of trash things. Um, I just love these na labels um, in here, though. You, you can see he's grouped them more in the center, and you have all the wonderful other elements around. But uh, this one, which I think is hilarious, and I have to say, it's the boot polish um, Shinola. Um, he, both Vicente and uh, certainly de Kooning was well known for sort of butchering his English, but very wittingly and <laughs> very cleverly. And he was known for, he called, he called himself a slipping glimpser uh, when he sort of wanted to go in and out of a room. And I can't help but think um, that Vicente, who did not suffer fools gladly, <laughs> was sort of thinking, uh, well, he doesn't know shit from Shinola, which was a popular expression then as now, and uh, although it's, I, we should revive that one if you really want to say somebody's pretty dumb, but I couldn't resist thinking that. I think he would have definitely gotten the joke on, Sh on Shinola, he wouldn't have missed that one. Uh, but um, uh, to go on, there's 10th Street, if you can see, I think you can see 10th well, you see here. Uh, well, I'm not doing very well at seeing. I thought you, this is the gallery. This is Tanninger. And as you can see, this is de Kooning in front of his building, which is obviously the one just up here, uh, and Rosenberg. Um, on the steps, again, it was, um, you couldn't overemphasize the compactness of the art world at that moment. Um, just in these old, uh, you know, almost tenement brownstones that lined the, the streets, the East 10th, East, East 11th, East, East 12th. Um, this is a very, very beautiful piece, and it's interesting. You can see now that that scale, this is not drawing paper size. This is a very large scale piece. It's called uh, Black Susan. It's from 1968, uh, large scale, and this also happens to be in our collection, collection which is an amazing uh, work to have. The, some, much of the work went back to Spain. They built a building, a museum there, and which I'll show you in a moment. But um, uh, this is one piece that they wanted to remain uh, in, in America. But I love that when you can actually see him uh, with the papers in his hand. It's, for, it's virtually finished, but uh, he might have just, uh, you know, affixed one of those. I suppose one affixed the uh, works <laughs> not on the wall, but flat. That would be smarter. <laughs> and, uh, um, but these, you know, collage, they, they. Uh, Hold up beautifully. What we do have is quite a few here on view, so I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, he showed at the Egan Gallery, he um, showed at many galleries, Perido, the Egan, but here's a, a picture with a distinguished group that's Vicente on the far left, and then um, Ibram Lassau, Thomas Brinson, Franz Klein, uh, de Kooning and just standing there up in the back. And um, de Kooning, Egan himself, and uh, the third artist is Torkov, Jack Torkov. Um, so these are the artists that were um, exhibiting together again at, at that time. Um, this, now these are, uh, I want to show a series of the collages that are in fact on view here. Um, 
I would hesitate to give you an assignment, but uh, it's well worth a little close looking, particularly since we have now uh, had our primer on collage and, and Vicente's approach to it. And just to know that these, of course, are much later works than we've been looking at because they are from this late period, the 90s, 1990s. But to see also how he would draw around the edges of certain, emphasize the edges, so to speak, by taking a line with a, a charcoal or pastel and ad additive. And that's what he loved about the process. It was additive. So even when you had finished with tearing and pasting and all that, you might go back in and, and add to it in, in that sense. So very interesting. It, they really bear close, close looking, which we have you know, are lucky enough to be able to do. So all of these collages that I'm showing are on the sort of salon wall in the gallery two on the right, the gallery, first gallery on the right, uh, which we've sort of wanted to evoke uh, his studio, which you can see in the photographs in the spine by Laurie Lambrecht. But um, so you can see them, they're all hanging on that salon triple triple hung wall. Um, here's another one. They're just so beautiful. Do they look like something? I, I don't. Do they need to? I don't think so. Um, I think we all fall in this show hearing about Vicente and the gardens and we're all going to see, you know, lupine or peonies somewhere <laughs> in a lot of these works, but I, I don't know that that was uh, Vicente's intention. He's really here looking closely at form and, um, and the overdrawing and what makes a work of art. It's a very highly, um, despite being additive, you have to be very careful about what you're adding. You know, you can't, you can't get too carried away with collage. Um, you, you, you see there's really no depth to these, despite some of the highlighting. Um, it's more of a flat picture paint plane, which of course the critic, um, Clement Greenberg, always talked about that. He didn't want any depth. He didn't want anything to come out in a painting. It was all supposed to be on a flat, which many, many of the abstract expressionists, hard to tell if, they were painting like that, or they just decided to oblige Mr. Greenberg. <laughs> but there's a whole school of painting that, uh, um, in that kind of abstraction, was just very, very, s you think of stripes and uh, uh, no permutations in the colors. That was very much Greenberg's idea. These, of course, have much more um, additive qualities than that. Um, you may wonder if, in fact, um, Vicente is an abstract expressionist in the same way that we think of other artists in that uh, ru rubric. Um, you know, art historians have just made, <laughs> I was going to say fortunes, but let's just say great careers out of naming periods of art that didn't have any names. The great uh, Barbara Novak, she saw all these 19th century paintings of ships or shorelines and they were so, the light was incredible and there were like four or five of them that she could call to mind and nobody particularly thought they were a group or the type of painting was that. And then she said, this is luminism. This is in the 1950s. She was a graduate student at Columbia. P.S. She couldn't get a degree in American art either. <laughs> She, no, she couldn't, they didn't, they wouldn't grant doctorates to anyone talking about American art, so she's, she kind of was, she said, all right, we'll just say you did Greek, okay. She said, okay, fine, just give me the degree. But um, she said, this is luminism, let's just, you know, there's no way around it. These paintings glow, they're about water and light and sea, you know. So that school got a name. It's not a huge school, but um, you, you know it when you see it. And again, abstract expressionism fit the, fit the bill for quite a number of artists. It doesn't really fit the bill for Vicente, would you agree? 
you don't think about him in the, although largely speaking, yes, that's a, you know, it's a big tent, so yes. And also something called the New York School, which is a much baggier um, category even. So it takes in a lot more things. So he was, as you can see, there's um, no question that he was very much what we could call a player. He was in the scene and painting and, uh, talking to the same people as um, all that group of artists. But at some point, and I could name a few other artists, but I'm not going to, the term lyrical abstractionist came in. OK, so that you might see Vicente referred to in that way, which is OK. He probably thought it was OK, too. Or he didn't pay much attention to it would be the other idea. These are um, all so beautiful um, and just very, very different from applying paint. Uh, really, a, I hesitate to use the term unique because it has to, that means one specific thing. So he's not the only person that, he was certainly one of the few that continued collage as a practice throughout his whole lifetime. And I, I think they're just extraordinary uh, and well worth, um, you know, this sort of independent focus, I hope you agree, and um, the moment to look at these uh, is one not to pass up, really, maybe. Ho hopefully we'll all look at them a bit differently. So he always said, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not abstracting nature. I love nature, I'm in, I can be in nature, but um, I'm not actually trying to convey it in that sense. And here we see, um, see him in the beautiful gardens, which are really meadows. He's done a little cultivation. It's really almost natural. Uh, very much what was there, I would say, over the years, he and Harriet enhanced uh, the plantings. They certainly introduced poppies, which not, not all of us have. Um, his barn, his barn studio is right there. Uh, this is looking south. This is looking out the back door of the house. And um, there he was, always, he said, always close to nature in that sense. Uh, this is an interior view of the studio. You see he's put up the wall there. And uh, we kind of love that low uh, lip on the wall that he put, um, strip, really, just so he could hang up the painting, so we uh, work to have that as part of the studio uh, gallery, so you could see that. This looks very neat and up, doesn't it? Like they, <laughs> like they knew the photographer was coming. Um, but that's, you know, quite an interior, quite, quite a beautiful space in the old barn with the, of course, add, adding the skylights, which is first that as you have probably heard in our origin story here, when the architects for this building, uh, the firm Herzog and Demeron, who are based in Basel, and they wanted to know about the area, they wanted to know about the flora and fauna, the geomorphology, and what are these creatures called the artists? Where are they? What are they doing? We've heard about the artists here. So um, we took them to quite a few studios, which they, really sort of absorbed, and one typology that they're postmodernists, so they had to get a typology for it, was the barn, the converted barn. Some of these 18th and 19th century barns, they were still standing, but uh, first move, of course, on when any artist is to bring in some north light, the best light for painting. Um, just a few more pictures of the garden. Now we have these guys which are also fun to look at closely. He, as we uh, know, he started out as a sculptor. He never, he liked to work. And remember how tactile it is with the, um, uh, with the paper and tearing the paper. I mean, there's sort of an immediacy of it going right from your hand to the, to the work of art. There's not the medi me mediation of a, of a brush even. You're really, uh, as it is with oil painting, but you're really making something. So these, we, we understand, um, you know, perhaps in making wooden stretchers for your work, 
little bits of uh, scrap wood he would find on the uh, studio floor and really enjoyed um, working with these bits to make small sculptures. Some of them look, uh, you might say, vaguely cubist. And they do, actually on the left is more of a toy. He called them all divertimentos, but this is a toy. As you can see, he's got an old salt, salt, why can't I say that? Salt shaker, let me just say shaker there, that he's conscripted in painting. And this was probably you know, really a toy uh, that if you pull the string, which of course we tried to hide so no one would be tempted, but there is a string. And it does work. The, what happens? The head goes down, the tail goes up, or something like that. Uh, it is really a little toy he found, or someone gave him that he made the sculpture out of. Um, just wonderful to think about him uh, in these very playful moments, as it were. And now that painting is a painting. <laughs> It's not a collage, but you can see the, the conversation um, among his work. Did he do a collage very much like this and say, huh, I'm going to do a painting? Hard to know, you know. Um, and he has even gone back and sometimes worked on um, paintings and, and added collages to what ha might have been a painting at base. I, he, um, here he is with uh, King Juan Carlos, this is in 91, and Queen Sophia getting a Medal of Honor in the arts uh, from them. And then shortly after that uh, was the beginning of this. Um, Spain um, had a big effort in these, um, obviously, years when there was money for art and culture. Every, you know, sometimes Countries have more, sometimes less, but this was a point where the goal was sort of to have a museum in every one of the uh, provinces, you might say, like uh, this is Segovia, where this is the provinces Castile y Leon, which of course is where he was born. And uh, this is a beautiful old, this was King, I got look, King Henry IV. <laughs> yeah, the original building is from 1450, it was a, um, Actually, that's interesting. That's Velasquez time, right? Um, I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but um, so there was a lot going on in Spain. Um, but this this original facade is part of that palace, and they were the galleries were redone. But you see these beautiful spaces, um, and there was quite a bit of work that they returned to. Um, that the foundation, a stable, well, they were both still, he, he was still alive um, by the time that the museum was finished. And he um, both, uh, he and Harriet are finally and eternally resting there in their museum, which is quite sweet, uh, in nature, as it were. Um, I just, in, in closing, I would just draw your attention to five small works, which are also on the salon hung drawing wall that we did, which looks wonderful, I think. Thank you very much. Not my idea, but it looked wonderful, our designer. Um, and these are five uh, late works in the sense that they were, these are the very, some of the very last things that he did. He and Harriet would typically go back into the city, had a beautiful apartment and studio in Des Artistes on the um, west side and you know, stay for the winter, travel. This year he wasn't well. He didn't feel up to, they didn't feel up to moving him, sort of moving into the city, so they stayed here. And he didn't get into, out to the studio, but he would sit either on a sun porch that was enclosed and warm or by a window that had sun streaming in, so sort of always in, in light, in, in view of the garden. And he made these beautiful, um, Pastels. Pastel is a pretty malleable me medium. You know, you don't have to put a whole lot of pressure every time. It would have been even if he wasn't feeling well. It was a medium that he um, could could use uh, easily. And these are just beautiful. Um, that you know, 
You gotta say, it looks like a tree, but you know, did, did he somehow go back to being more a representative of looking at the garden? I don't know, you know, those could be random uh, marks there, but it looks like a tree trunk, right? Uh, also, looks more like heaven, sky, what? But they're just, they're just lovely, and it's, it, it, I think it's enormously poignant to think about um, that in his last days, he uh, passed away. This was the fall of 2000, and then he passed away in 2001 in, in uh, January. This one. <laughs> so it's sweet to think about these as his last works, and I couldn't resist this sort of wonderful comparison. He was, uh, he was called central casting. He was an extraordinary looking uh, man and his very much um, about being an artist. That was his calling and his life. Thank you. That's it.